All right, so here we talk about the proposal-based class of instance segmentation algorithms. I've, um, you know, it's a broad field. There are very many approaches that do more or less different things. I have here broadly summarized them in a generic algorithm and, uh, you know, surely uh, I'm not doing justice to each subtle variation of any of these algorithms, but uh, I think by and large uh, they can be summarized as follows. So we um, operate in a so-called sliding window fashion, meaning uh, we take a patch of interest and then we process one patch at a time um, across the entire image. Um, of course, on a, on a GPU, you would like to do this in parallel. And in general, such sliding window approaches are very efficient because um, in each uh, patch, you do the same thing. And this maps well um, to the kind of um, hardware that we have nowadays. So uh, we start by asking um, for each location. Uh, one or more of uh, the following questions. Um, am I a seed? And by seed, I mean, am I the center of an instance? Um, so, for example, you know, as you see down here, um, these would be the windows. We could have them with or without spatial overlap. And uh, then we turn this here into a classification problem. Yeah? So we train a new network to answer um, for each of these windows the question, do I think I am the center of an instance or not? So am I a seed? Um, then we can also ask, well, uh, if I were a seed, what class would I be? A uh, dog or a cat or a potted plant? Um, or to make things a bit more fine-grained, because after all, you know, in this example, um, here just eight by eight windows are used. And well, sometimes uh, the cats and the dogs, they will not, you know, like to sit precisely in one of your, um, in the middle of one of your 64 windows. Uh, so you can also um, try and estimate a bit of an offset. So you can uh, try and answer the question relative to me, where is the closest seat? Uh, so um, this, here would be a classification problem. This would be a classification problem. This here would be a regression problem. Now, if we estimate a, a, an X offset and a Y offset, then it's natural to formulate this as a regression of, of two numbers. Um, or rather than talking um, just about seeds, um, we can try and approximate the instance already with a bounding box. Um, also here, that would be an example of a regression problem. And um, for example, in this paper here, which is called single shot multibox detector, uh, the way this is parametrized is that um, there is the offset in the x direction is being estimated, the offset in the y direction of the bounding box is being estimated, and then the width and the height of the bounding box. So these are four numbers which you can estimate by regression. And then, by the way, what does conf mean here? This means for key P classes, the confidence that, uh, well, this window is the center of an instance of one out of the P classes, such as cat, dog, or, or potted plant. All right. Um, now, uh, already indicated here are some tricks that you can do. Um, so rather than just use uh, this shape of the window, uh, you can also simultaneously do this for several aspect ratios. So you could ask these yes or no questions, am I center of an instance, um, not just for this bounding box, but also for that bounding box, uh, which is centered at the very same window. And in fact, for all of those bounding boxes. Um, so you can do this um, for multiple aspect ratios and potentially um, for multiple scales. Um, so for each location, and possibly for each scale, and 
for each aspect ratio. We try and answer one of these questions um, that I've just discussed. Now, um, having done this uh, densely um, for all locations in the image, um, we will typically get redundant estimates. So, for example, um, for the dog, um, we might have found this bounding box which says, I am the center of dog instance. But if we go across scales, we might also have found that bounding box. Um, or maybe um, this bounding box here also answered uh, to being center of a dog instance. Um, so we, uh, no, we usually have too many um, hits or too many detections. Better too many than too few, but still uh, too many usually. Or at least the, the systems are trained such that they give you too many. Um, now there is only one dog in this instance, and they're not five. Um, so we need to decimate um, the seeds or the bounding boxes, and uh, that happens in a step which I here call generically inference. And all right, so if this if this works well, then we have, for example, one mask left for the cat, one mask or one bounding box left for the cat, one bounding box left for the dog, or one seed left for the cat, one seed left for the dog, and then conditioned on these seeds or bounding boxes or region proposals, uh, we then need to estimate um, the precise shape of the thing. As I've already briefly indicated, um, we can do this um, by for example, reshaping this to an 8x8 window and then predicting for each of these 8x8 pixels, does it hold that, or does it belong to the instance or not? And then this would give us, in this case, a coarse outline of, of the dog. All right, that would be the generic algorithm. And I have already alluded to one particular realization, this example one, um, this, uh, what was it called? Single shot multibox detector. I want to um, give you another example, uh, which is a few years older, but actually more general. And uh, uh, this is work from uh, Jürgen Gall, Viktor Lempitsky, um, two outstanding computer vision researchers. Um, uh, these are always names to look out for. So uh, you see this was, uh, all right, this was a figure one in 2009, uh, but also this was pre-neural network area. Yeah? So it was always a good idea to start not with many classes, but just with one. So this paper cares only about pedestrians. Uh, and secondly, well, in this figure one, there's just a single pedestrian. Actually, it, it, this also worked for more than one, as, as I'll show you below. Um, so, with a pedestrian, the task is to detect that pedestrian. Uh, I mentioned a sliding window approach. So, um, all of these patches here are being used. Um, also, the ones that are not highlighted in this picture. And here, each patch votes, uh, actually here, each patch casts many votes, or you could say each patch votes for a distribution, namely, um, for example, the red patch uh, casts votes for where it thinks, if it is part of a pedestrian, where the center of that pedestrian would be. Yeah, so this patch here, the red one, is casting votes. And as you can see on the right hand side, well, some votes, uh, um, you know, they go astray. They're not uh, terribly helpful. Um, but, but actually many of the votes, so if you zoom in, there are very many red points here in the middle, actually many votes do the good thing. Yeah? So they point to actually where approximately the center of the pedestrian is. Now, um, the green patch uh, was also voting for center of pedestrian, and it is not very confident. So we see a little bit of green. Uh, I see a greenish cloud here. Maybe you don't, but it's not really, you know, very clear. And uh, the blue patch is more interesting. 
uh, because the blue patch um, clearly recognized, uh, well, I am a foot, and uh, moreover, it even recognized uh, that, well, the, f the foot is pointing upward. Yes, yeah, so if you see an upward pointing foot, where is the center of the human normally? Well, it's normally up and to the left. And indeed, this is where, as you see here in this density, this is where most votes are being cast. Um, but sometimes people just standing up also lift their toes. So maybe the center of the human could be here. This patch does not really vote for the center of the human being there because that's physically sort of you know not possible. Um, good. So we have these many, you know, many many votes. Uh, many of them are nonsense, but somehow the majority you know seems to do okay. Now shown here in this picture were the votes from just three patches. Um, now we can let all patches vote, and uh, the result is shown here. And uh, the authors call this a half image. And now you see that there is a clear maximum in this uh, half image somewhere here. And uh, that gives us you know, confidence that probably there is a pedestrian here. We see more local minima, strictly speaking. So there's also local minimum or maximum here, a local maximum there. But these are much, much weaker. So we can use some threshold you know, heuristics uh, to decide uh, what we will and will not accept as a, as a pedestrian. Um, so what has happened here, you know, relative to the above approach, um, it is also sliding window style approach. Um, but here, um, the votes for the seeds have been, uh, I would say, a bit more non-local. Um, yeah. Is it same? Is it different? I, I don't know. Um, I think actually this approach on the bottom is, is a bit more flexible. Good. Now, when we get this kind of image, or from the example one, we will get a similar kind of image, but much coarser. Um, from the example above, we would get not an image, but we would get a tensor. So um, we would get uh, eight by eight, uh, but then we have as an extra dimension, these different aspect ratios. And then we have as an extra dimension, which I cannot really show as a fourth dimension, uh, we might have different scales. Um, but still, even in this higher dimensional space, we will have local maxima, just as we had here. And the task now is, uh, when, when we want to decimate um, redundant bounding boxes, or when we want to decimate redundant votes, if we want to keep only the top dog, you know, the best vote, and uh, discard the other ones that basically talk about the same thing, then we need this clustering step or decimation step or inference step. And this is what I want to talk about next. So inference, um, the one that I will uh, comment on first is called non-maximum suppression. And it's just, you know, the most primitive thing um, conceivable. So let's say we have space and uh, then we have let's say these are votes. What non-maximum suppression does uh, I do this in red, non-maximum suppression. What it does is that, well, it finds the highest peak, which would be here. And it then uh, kills everything in a fixed neighborhood. So um, the result after step one, okay, let me um, copy this diagram first um, so I can use it again. way too much stuff now. Let's see. Good. All right. So what this looks like after 
after step one is um, we have uh, found our um, first maximum. Uh, this is our first detection. And then we update our votes um, to go to strictly zero here. So we suppress everything that is in a neighborhood and come up with this updated uh, vote landscape. Now we look for the highest peak again, which I think would be here. So this would be our second detection, number two. Um, we again suppress everything in the neighborhood. So we update um, our votes to look like this. And uh, you know, iterate, um, there is a third detection. We update our votes to look like that. Um, all right, it's getting very colorful. So I'm showing here in uh, yellow the remaining part of uh, the votes that we have not killed. And uh, then you also use some, uh, well, probably, so we also need to define some threshold uh, beyond which we no longer accept votes. Uh, so if the threshold is too low, uh, it would go on by making detections, excuse me, uh, by making uh, a fourth and a fifth detection here and here. Um, if we put the um, threshold, you know, this is one of the many, many tweaking parameters here. If we uh, tune this well, then it will just make the detections that we want. Well, or did we? You know, here I see clearly two distinct maxima, so maybe this approach is too simplistic and we'll look at an alternative in a moment. Um, so this would be non-maximum suppression, just the simplest thing ever, you know, it's just a greedy algorithm. Um, it is a greedy algorithm, which actually can be seen as an, a poor approximation to the so-called facility location problem, which is NP-hard. And uh, this is the viewpoint taken in this paper. Again, uh, well, Victor Lipinski is one of the authors here. Um, where they say, all right, there's a facility location problem. We try and solve it exactly or near exactly. We try and solve it very crudely with non-maximum suppression, and we try and solve it using an intermediate greedy strategy, which is a little bit better than uh, non-maximum suppression. But the main reason I'm showing you this picture here is um, to give you a, a feeling for what these um, you know, peak detection problems can look like. So on the left are pedestrians. Uh, on the right, uh, you can clearly identify are the corresponding maxima. So what non-maximum suppression would do here, it would start with the brightest spot. Maybe, um, maybe this one here would be number one. And then we exclude all the votes in a fixed neighborhood of detection number one. The second brightest maybe is number two. The third brightest maybe is number three. And you go on. Now, a uh, fun fact, um, so how many uh, maxima do we count here? Uh, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, maybe, six, seven, eight or so. Um, now let's look at this. Um, there is one person. Now here um, I notice a two, three, because uh, there's an extra foot. Um, there is four, there is difficult five, six, and I think seven, because I see an extra head, uh, seven. And then there is eight, nine, 10, 11. Maybe you come to a different count. Um, but so here, you know, us humans, we saw 11 detections. Uh, the system saw eight. And now this was pre-neural network era. Um, you can, of course, do, you know, uh, a little bit better than that. Um, but it just shows you, you know, how good um, humans are because we do reasoning. We know all the, the parts that a body is supposed to have, and uh, even just spotting a single foot or hand or nose uh, will tell us there is an extra person hiding there. Good. So this was a uh, mean shift. Uh, excuse me. This was a non-maximum suppression. Um, but what if I do want? Um, what if I do think that uh, actually here I see two 
distinct maxima, not one. And as you've just seen in the image here, um, well, there are plenty of scenarios where things can be pretty close by. Um, then perhaps you want to use something different, and I've discussed it at length in the machine learning lecture, so I'll be very short here. Uh, but basically, what we do is we start a gradient ascent from each point in space, and uh, this partitions uh, my space as follows. Something like that. So I've now partitioned it here by mean shift into um, those parts that if I do a, if I you know if I just start walking uphill from any point in my space, um, all the walkers or hikers that end up in the same maximum, um, they belong to the same region. And uh, so the advantage here is that uh, non-maximum suppression only found one peak here. A mean shift would actually find these two distinct peaks. Very nice procedure also. Good. Uh, then there are more clustering algorithms. If uh, again, remember, uh, k-means will not qualify because we're looking for algorithms uh, that give us the number of clusters, not algorithms which, like k-means, expect us to give them the right number of clusters. Um, so I mentioned the maximum suppression. I mentioned mean shift. Um, there is also something called single linkage clustering, um, or a fancier version of it, uh, HDB scan, which I'm mentioning here, and there are others. So, summary. Um, these proposal-based or top-down methods, they work really well. So, if you look at um, the winners of uh, today's instant segmentation benchmarks, um, you know, I would say there is a three-quarter chance that the number one is a proposal-based method. Uh, on the downside, uh, these things are really highly engineered. Um, I mean, to, to win a, a benchmark on natural images, you always have to engineer. Uh, but to my mind, these proposal-based methods uh, necessitate or use even a bit more of engineering than the alternative class I will present afterwards. Um, And they are, I, I wrote this comment in the end, not truly end-to-end. -end. What I mean by that is usually you train the detector first and uh, then given the detector results, you train the second stage, which gives you the mask. Um, on the one hand, this is an advantage because the mask estimation step can use all detections simultaneously. And uh, perhaps in the sense of reductionism, it's also not a bad idea to train these stages separately. On the other hand, um, the common experience in uh, neural network training over the past few years has been that usually, if possible, um, if you can pass gradient through all your steps, and if you have enough training data and if you have enough compute, usually it's helpful to train the entire thing jointly or end to end. And uh, this is usually uh, um, even more difficult with these first detect, then estimate the shape kind of procedures. But if done right, they work really well.